The speed torque profile we examined is meant to represent a NEMA Design B motor, a commonly available motor suitable for numerous applications like blowers and pumps. Other speed torque profiles exist, the second most common being a NEMA Design D motor. Design D motors are designed for high inertia starts like a crane or a hoist. As evidenced by the speed torque curve, Design D motors produce higher torque at lower speeds. What's nice about these generic speed torque curves is if we were to plot them using not specific numerical data, but rather percentage of synchronous speed and percentage of rated torque and percentage of rated power, we could make educated guesses about points on the speed torque curve. If we were to define the vertical axis as percentage of rated torque and the horizontal axis as percentage of synchronous speed, design B and D motors might look something like this. A design B motor is expected to produce 100% of its rated torque at 1 to 5-ish percent slip, depending on size and manufacturer. Assuming 3% slip, this means 100% rated torque occurs at 97% of synchronous speed. Design B motors ordinarily experience a peak breakdown torque around 200% of its rated torque, somewhere around 80-ish percent of synchronous speed. Finally, a Design B motor might produce 150-ish percent of its rated torque at 0% of synchronous speed or at locked rotor conditions. In contrast, a Design D motor will produce 100% of its rated torque at an increased slip. Assuming 10% slip, this means 100% rated torque occurs at roughly 90% of synchronous speed. Finally, a Design D motor produces around 300% of its rated torque at 0% of synchronous speed or at locked rotor conditions. These speed torque curves imply that a Design B motor experiences peak mechanical power output. The product of torque and rotational speed occurs at a faster rotational speed, whereas a similarly rated Design D motor will experience peak mechanical power output at a much slower rotational speed. Note that the B power curve has a more significant rightward lean than the D power curve, not as much. This again points towards the intended purpose of these different types of motors. Design D motors favor the lower speed, higher slip, higher torque applications one would expect for higher inertia loads. Besides the speed torque curves, there are two other fundamental differences between Design B and Design D motors, the first being their rotors. Design D rotors, in comparison to Design B rotors, feature conductive bars with higher resistance. I'll explain in later lectures how a wound rotor induction motor, another type of induction motor, can vary rotor resistance to change the shape of the speed torque curve depending upon application. The second noticeable difference between Design B and Design D motors is their efficiency. Again, we've yet to discuss electrical properties and efficiency. However, Design B motors are relatively efficient, whereas Design D motors, not so much. Meaning a Design D style motor will consume more real electrical power input to produce usable mechanical power output. Now before you take the time to memorize these charts, let me make this important disclaimer. They are only reasonably accurate. A specific manufacturer might sell Design B motors that do not produce 100% of rated torque at exactly 97% of synchronous speed, but rather at 98% or even 95%. An entirely different manufacturer might sell Design D motors that don't produce exactly 300% of rated torque at locked rotor conditions, but rather 280%. You get what I'm saying. Additionally, there's a significant performance difference between small and large motors, where the dividing line between small and large is somewhat arbitrary. Smaller fractional horsepower motors might exhibit more slip at the rated conditions, whereas larger integral horsepower motors might exhibit less slip at the rated conditions. Fractional horsepower motors, by the way, means motors with output of less than one horsepower, examples being three quarter, half, third, and a quarter, and so on. Get it? Fractions. Conversely, an integral horsepower motor means a motor with one horsepower output or more, examples being one, two, three, five, and so on. These larger motors might exhibit less slip at the rated conditions than these charts suggest. This being said, these charts are still pretty good, and you can use them as a general guideline for what you might encounter in the field. If you want accurate information, you'd have to consult the manufacturer's data sheet for the specific motor of interest. Assuming these charts are accurate, we can make some educated guesses how a certain motor might operate. Consider a two horsepower Design B motor with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. We know nothing else about this motor. Using the generic chart, we might reasonably expect this motor will experience rated conditions at maybe 97% of 1800 RPM or 1746 RPM. 
This would be the rated speed you'd see on this motor's nameplate. Again, it might be more, it might be less. However, let's assume this is true. At the rated conditions, this motor is known to produce two horsepower of mechanical power output. A unit conversion demonstrates two horsepower as equivalent to two times 746 or 1,492 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for torque demonstrates that torque at the rated conditions is roughly 8.2 newton meters. 8.2 newton meters therefore represents 100% of rated torque. At peak power output, we might reasonably suspect this motor is capable of generating 150% of two horsepower or three horsepower. Finally, we might reasonably expect this motor to exert a maximum of let's say two times 18.2 newton meters or 16.3 newton meters and be capable of exerting, let's say, 1.5 times 8.2 newton meters, or roughly 12.2 newton meters at the locked rotor conditions. Let's try the same thing for a design D motor. Consider a three horsepower design D motor with a synchronous speed of 1200 RPM. We know nothing else about this motor. We might reasonably expect this motor to experience rated conditions at maybe 90% of 1200 RPM, or 1080 RPM. This would be the rated speed you would see on this motor's nameplate. Again, it might be more, it might be less. However, let's assume it's true. At the rated conditions, this motor is known to produce three horsepower of mechanical power output. A unit conversion demonstrates three horsepower is equivalent to 2,238 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for torque demonstrates torque at the rated conditions is roughly 19.8 newton meters. 19.8 newton meters therefore represents 100% of rated torque. At peak power output, we might reasonably suspect this motor capable of generating 150% of 3 horsepower or 4.5 horsepower. Finally, we might reasonably expect this motor to be capable of exerting 3 times 19.8 newton meters, roughly 59.4 newton meters at locked rotor conditions. That's more than enough torque to yank your balls right out of your sockets. Again, these might be reasonable approximations of what you might expect, and actual motor performance will vary widely. Always consult the manufacturer data sheet for your particular motor of interest. The curious among you may ask, what do designs A, C, and E speed torque curves look like? The speed torque curves for A's and E's for all intents and purposes kind of look like B's. This is an obvious overgeneralization. There are subtle mechanical and electrical differences between these types of motors. However, at this early stage in the game, these subtleties may escape your notice. Design C's kind of look like a B in a D motor had a baby. Design C's produce higher starting torque than B's, but not as much as D's. Their rated torque, however, occurs at a lower degree of slip, similar to that of a B. You'd think everyone would use well-organized and well-labeled charts, but they don't. Often motor manufacturers try to cram a bunch of information on one page and use one color to do so. Here's an example of what you might encounter in the field. This is the data sheet for a one horsepower Design B motor intended to operate using 460 volt three phase AC. Look at all those dashed lines. Let's see if we can make sense of this foolishness. seem confusing at first, but there's a lot of important information on this plot, and given some practice and repeat exposure, it's relatively easy to interpret. The key data point to remember is that this is a one horsepower motor. The horizontal x-axis isn't speed, it's percent power output, or 100% of rated power output, or one horsepower, is this vertical line right here. Anything to the right of the vertical one horsepower line is an overload condition. Anything on the vertical one horsepower line is the rated condition, and anything to the left of the vertical one horsepower line is an underloaded condition. We see this motor can produce 0% up to 150% of one horsepower, 
or 1.5 horsepower at peak conditions. The datasheet plots torque using a dashed line, RPM using another type of dashed line, current using another type of dashed line, efficiency in a solid line, and power factor using another type of dashed line. Again, we haven't explored electrical properties yet. However, realize every piece of data on the motor nameplate is specified at 100% of rated power output or one horsepower. I know there's a lot of dashes dashing all over the place, but the intersection of each dashed line with a vertical one horsepower line is most likely what is specified in the motor nameplate. For example, if a regular dashed line means rotational speed, it looks like at 100% of rated power, the rated speed might be around 1770 RPM. A rotational speed of 1770 RPM for a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM represents a slip of only 1.6%. This is the level of variability I was referring to earlier one might expect to observe between different motor manufacturers and different motor sizes. In fact, there's a lot of variability shown in this example as we'll soon learn. You note the vertical y-axis specifying rotational speed starts at 1800 RPM and only goes to 1700 RPM. Basically, this chart is only presenting data on the extreme right-hand side of the speed torque curve. Why? Because that's where you should operate this motor, i.e. around the rated conditions. You'll note the dashed rotational speed slopes downwards, left to right. This makes sense. Under loaded regions to the left of the rated conditions, the motor will speed up. Whereas overloaded regions to the right of the rated conditions, the motor will slow down. If dash double dash represents torque, this motor exerts around three pound foot of torque at the rated conditions. What in the hell is a pound foot? Google says it's an archaic torque measurement used by ignorant savages that happens to equal around 4.1 Newton meters. You note know, the dash double dash torque line slopes upward left to right. It makes sense. Under loaded regions to the left of the rated conditions, the motor exerts less torque. Whereas over loaded regions to the right of the rated conditions, the motor exerts more torque. Now that we have rotational speed and torque data at the rated conditions, let's examine mechanical power output and efficiency. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates 4.1 newton meters of torque at 1770 RPM represents 759.9 watts of mechanical power. If one horsepower is equal to 746 watts, 759.9 watts is just above one horsepower as we might expect. It's a one horsepower motor. If this solid line represents efficiency, this motor appears to be maybe 86% efficient at the rate of conditions. Given the efficiency rating and mechanical power output, we can solve for the necessary real power input consumed by this motor at the rate of conditions. An algebraic manipulation of the efficiency formula solving for input power demonstrates we will most likely need to consume at least 883.6 watts of real electrical power. Let's check if we're right. Again, we haven't examined electrical properties in great detail just yet. However, let's perform some quick calculations of the rated conditions as a warm-up exercise for the following lectures discussing electrical properties of squirrel cage induction motors in greater detail. If this dashed line, big surprise, it's dashed, represents current, looks like this motor draws maybe 1.8 amps at the rated conditions. If this other dashed line represents power factor, it looks like this motor has a power factor of 0.62 at the rated conditions. This motor is intended to operate using 460 volt three phase AC as a balanced load. As such, we can make use of the single watt meter method to determine power, where apparent power is square root three times line to line voltage times line current. Substituting our given values yields 1434.1 or roughly 1.4 kilovolt amperes of apparent power. Real power is apparent power times power factor. Roughly 1.4 kilovolt amperes times 0.62 yields roughly 889.2 watts of real electrical power, extremely close to the 883.6 watts we calculated earlier using mechanical power output and efficiency. It all makes sense. Lastly, since this motor data sheet does not include a complete speed torque curve for the whole range from 0 to 1800 RPM, it specifies a couple pieces of data, namely the breakdown torque listed as BDT, which it specifies as a maximum of 16.5 pound foot which Google says is roughly 22.4 newton meters, much higher than the 200% we might expect, which just goes to show you that expectations are there to be crushed. Additionally, it says it has an LRT, or locked rotor torque of 11.4 pound foot, which Google says is roughly 15.4 newton meters. This is much higher than the 150% rated torque we might expect.
Again, always consult the manufacturer's data sheet for the specific motor of interest for the most accurate data. Lastly, the motor includes an additional data point called PUT, which stands for pull-up torque, which is kind of the lower belly of a speed torque curve for a design B motor. Now that I mention it, I probably should discuss the significance of pull-up torque for Design B squirrel cage induction motors. Close inspection of a general speed torque curve for a Design B squirrel cage induction motor shows torque kind of dips down between lock rotor torque and breakdown torque. This low point in the bottom of the valley is the pull-up torque. I think the easiest way of describing the significance of pull-up torque is using a simplified example. Consider a motor with a locked rotor torque of 1.4 newton meters, a pull-up torque of 1.2 newton meters, and a breakdown torque of 2 newton meters, and a rated torque of 1 newton meter. I don't want this to devolve into a physics lesson, but consider an occasion in which the motor needs to move something that exerts a constant 1 newton meters of counter torque. Upon closure of a full voltage starter, the motor easily yanks the applied load to a start. Given there is sufficient lock rotor torque, the motor quickly accelerates and transitions to the rated speed. In summary, if the applied load is below the pull-up torque, i.e. the dip in the speed torque curve, the motor will accelerate until it reaches a stable speed and torque point on the curve. Not so if the applied load is above the pull-up torque. Consider the same motor moving something that exerts a constant 1.3 newton meters of counter torque, i.e. below the locked rotor torque, but above the pull-up torque. Upon closure of a full voltage starter, the motor does yank the applied load to a start, but then the motor ceases to accelerate and stalls just shy of the pull-up torque. Unless someone gives the load a good kick, this motor will remain in an undesirable overloaded condition. Lastly, lastly, the motor explicitly specifies inrush current or locked rotor amperes, LRA, one might expect to experience upon closure of a full voltage, direct on line or across the line starter. Ordinarily, we might expect inrush to be roughly six times rated current. If this motor is expected to draw 1.8 amps at rated conditions, we might expect a brief surge of six times 1.8 amps or 10.8 amps of inrush. This approximation isn't really true. Looks like the data sheet specifies this motor will draw a whopping 15.7 amps, 8.7 times the rated current, i.e. more than our six times shortcut calculation suggests. We'll examine inrush calculations and the electrical theory of inrush in later lectures. Long story short, all the information is right there on the data sheet. All you gotta do to interpret it is to learn to distinguish between a regular dashed line, a long dashed line, a short dashed line, a double dashed line, a dotted line, and a solid line. If this data sheet was something I need to refer to on a regular basis, I'd break out a box of colored pencils and make sense of it real quick. All right, that's about it for this introductory lecture on the mechanical properties of squirrel cage induction motors. I was going to go right into the electrical properties, however, this lecture is getting a little long already, and a complete discussion of electrical properties will only make it longer. We'll examine electrical properties like current, efficiency, and power factor at and at other than the rate of conditions in greater details in later lectures. In conclusion, this lecture examined the mechanical properties of squirrel cage induction motors. We discussed squirrel cage induction motor construction and basic theory of operation, examined speed torque curves for design B and design D motors, and waded through a swamp of dashes on a motor data sheet. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.